Uh, all right, man. What, which uh, which of these topics do you want to start with? You a- agile, agile, big agile versus little agile. What's the big agile versus little agile? So big agile is really pull, pull, pull it in, pull it. Up. You can pull it to yourself. You can you can hang out there. Yeah, it goes super far. Yeah. Well, that, that's good. Yeah, yeah. How's yeah, this? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So big agile is really uh, talking about specific practices as people understand. You know what agile is all about. Mm-hmm. Um, so things like you know doing sprint planning, doing sprint reviews, sprint retros, all, all of the events and the day-to-day practices. The little agile is, is a way of being rather than doing, uh, right? I see, I see. Um, so in software doesn't even enter into it in, in the little yeah. a, agile. It's more about a way of um, acting and a way of being. What, do you know what always, you always like, you always bother me about, uh, about uh, discussions about agile, little agile, is people will be like, "Oh, give me an example." Even on uh, message boards online and stuff like that, people people will be like, "Give me an example of, uh, give me an example of like non-software agility or whatever." And uh, I'm like, "Isn't like isn't Toyota's manufacturing like what everybody goes back to for like the golden standard of you know this is what agility looks like?" And it has nothing to do with writing software. Yeah, so lean agile is, is of course the roots, right? No, lean is the root. Yeah, lean. Agile. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, people do revert back to that, but these days it's mainly for history purposes. Like that's where it started. I don't know if in non-software areas of business people are actually practicing those lean principles as much today, you know, as they were in the uh, kind of like the manufacturing days. Yeah. Is this not, not a whole lot of manufacturing that happens today? I mean, what's going on is all done by robots. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah to a to a point. To a point. Like a, the 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 article that I shared recently. Uh, it's like nobody really commented on it, so I'm like, well, okay, dude. Uh, like one one person commented on it, but it, uh, the uh, uh, Numi plant in. Uh, uh, California, uh, I can't remember where. Uh, it's New Me, where is New Me? It's not. It's not in Oakland. It's in. Uh, it's not in Fresno. Oh boy, it's the Tesla plant now. Jeez, man. Hang on. Let's let's find out. See, this is where this is an example of some place that I'll I'll edit later. Uh, Fremont, Fremont, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this story, uh, it was the my Amer- here. I'll, I'll, I'll show. I'll tell you what it is here in a second. Uh, where is uh, where's my Slack? I sent this to myself. I'm doing too much on my laptop right now. Uh, you are doing a lot. Uh, uh, this American Life, This American Life, which is like a podcast sort of article kind of deal, and. They uh, had an episode uh, on the Numi plant. It's an hour-long episode uh, on, on the plant. It's very good, actually. And it's two parts. The first part is the introduction of, like, w- w- the background and what happened, uh, like, w- what started it and how it started, whatever, uh, of um, Toyota. 1985, Toyota uh, came to... Toyota decided that... <sighs> apparently like in japan they have like toyota city which like everybody who lives and work like you live in the city you work at the toyota plant like every like the the whole economy of the city is surrounding the plant basically Mm -hmm. and everybody that's there is very happy to work at the plant you know and they know that like the you know whatever the, the the plant makes their living or their life or whatever and um and in uh 1985 uh faced with like the realization of uh, globalization they realized and, and like uh, tariffs in the u.s because it's the early 80s uh, early to mid 80s right uh they realized that they were going to get hit with tariffs and other countries are going to start, start copying that so they were they're going to have to have to globalize okay which meant that they were going to have to take their manufacturing methods and replicate them with workforces from other countries so what they did was uh they uh got with gm who was their competitor, and they said, "Hey, let let we'll take one of your plants, and we will basically teach you our method of manufacturing. But you got to make our cars or whatever." So I think they made Corollas at that plant. I think, and um, 
GM, of course, was like, oh, you want to share all your secrets with us? Cool. Great. Let's do it. And they basically took the, and, and then GM gave them the Fremont uh, facility, which is like the worst facility on GM's books. Yeah. You think it was a test? Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, it turned out, like, it turned around and became the, uh, no, like, the number one facility uh, for car manufacturing. And, uh, and uh, this article is all about, like, uh, part one is, like, the decision to do it and the first group of people that started being trained and stuff like that. And part two is, like, how GM just, like, failed to replicate the, the experiment for the rest of their plants and, like, the, you know, the organizational background of why they couldn't do it. Yeah. So uh, I took, I took uh, like, what, what's here on, on uh, what's here on this little snippet that I sent to myself, which I can't see because it's tiny. It says, uh, this is a transcript of the podcast, by the way, but I'm going to, I'm going to paraphrase it. So it's like, uh, what's, what's different when you walk into the newbie plant? You know, I'll, uh, uh, you know, basically, basically, what I'm trying to get to is this part, which is like, why would, why would, right, yeah, right, this, this part right here. It answers something that never made sense to him. Why would Toyota be open to showing GM all of its operations? You know, and this is like, I listened to the entire, the article's an hour long. Uh, it's, it's like 64 minutes long. Very good, good to listen to, highly recommend. Uh, but this tiny little snippet was like the entire article for me uh, and like all my experience in like Scrum Master and product ownership and agility and all that stuff. This single paragraph summed up the entire article for me. And it wasn't as much as a light bulb moment for me, but it was like, of course, of course. It was, uh, it was that they, they meaning Toyota, Toyota leadership and everybody that worked Toyota, whatever, never prohibited us from walking through the plant, understanding even questioning their key people and he's this guy is you know this guy's wondering like why would they allow us basically full access to everything and he says i think that they recognized we were asking all the wrong questions we under we didn't understand this this bigger picture thing bigger picture thing which he explains up here as being like the teamwork and the management concept is what made them successful uh, all of our questions were focused on the floor, the assembly plant, what's happening on the line, and and none of them on the real issues, you know, which is the real issues. You have to listen to the whole article to hear his real issues, but his real issues is like if a worker on the line has a problem, they ring the bell, their direct supervisor or not really a supervisor, but like their direct team lead basically comes in and is like, hey, what's the problem? And then they exercise the uh, Toyota Kata questions, which you can, you can right. Google Toyota Kata questions and they'll tell you exactly what they are. But um, yes, yeah, so, so the 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 they they if the worker had a problem on the line, okay, let me start again and give me a second to pause. If the worker had a problem on the line, they'd pull a little uh, bell or whatever it was. I can't remember what it was. Oh, she's got a yingling. I didn't know they had yinglings. I didn't either. Oh man, good to know. It's one of my favorite beers right there. Um, anyway, uh, they pull the thing on the line, and then uh, their lead would come over and be like, "Hey, what what?" What's the problem that you're having? Uh, what's you know what's the condition uh, that you're seeing? Uh, you know, do you have any ideas of how to fix it or whatever? Like all the Toyota kind of questions. What you know, whatever those are, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, and uh, and uh, it's like a management philosophy, you know. I heard a slightly uh, different variant of that, which is you know, yes, everybody first of all is entitled, empowered, I should say, right, mm -hmm. to to pull the button or mm -hmm. whatever to stop the line yeah. and it's not frowned upon right um, that's the first thing the second thing is all the workers come together to see yeah. who can help fix the issue yeah 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 right which is amazing I mean it's just so counterculture to to what we're used to right, right? yeah uh, immediately as soon as you stop a production line it's it's frowned upon it's it's you know it's this blame thing like you stop the production line yeah. oh my god it's yeah, costing yeah, us yeah. money you know it, it's churning out bad parts or whatever the whatever the defect is. Huh. So it, you know, cut the loss now, and let's swarm and fix the problem. Uh, and yeah. that is just very counterculture to yeah, um, that, what we do today. That that's something else they say in the article. Something else they say in the article is like they'll uh, they found out because this is the same workforce. This is a GM workforce who just shifted over to start making Toyota cars. And when they start when they shifted over to make Toyota cars, they also started using Toyota parts. And they were like, the Toyota parts 
are a much higher quality than the GM parts that they were using. So like if they're putting on a lug nut or whatever, like the, the GM lug nuts is like a, the, the lug nut was like made of softer material or crappier material or the threads weren't right. Or you know what I mean? The, the bolts, the little nuts they were uh, putting them onto were like, they crossed cross threaded really easily or whatever. And they had to fix a cross thread or whatever. Like the point was like, they said, well, when we, when we had a problem, like we would stop and uh, we would tell the part maker they need to fix the part. And they're like at GM asking the part ma maker to fix a part, like the amount of pushback that you would get from the part maker would be like, you might as well not even ask a question because the, the part maker, the part maker would, would bas basically say like, well, this part works for every other plant. I don't understand why you're having a problem. And then they would just not do it or whatever, right. you know. But in the Toyota, like the Toyota part maker would be like, hey, if you had a problem, like what what problem were you having? How can we make it better? How You know what I mean? They were, the, the part makers were part of the life cycle of the product. So they would be actually invested in fixing it. And uh, yeah, there's, it's a, dude, it's a very interesting article, uh, you know, this, that, that little, that little, piece that i extracted it was like to me it was the best part of the article uh it was just like they just knew that the gm leadership would just wouldn't get it they yeah. just wouldn't get it it all yeah. starts at the top i'm interested in learning about how this uh, this pans out for for tesla because they inherited what's left of that yeah. plant right so um it'd be interesting oh if you actually look at the plant it's like the, the they use robotics and stuff <clears throat> to do big things but like the the rest of the car is still put together by people you know, the body panels are snapped in or the steering columns installed or whatever, like the, the big, but I mean, the car, obviously the car is like welded together by the machines and, and moved from P, uh, from line to line order by machines. Yeah. But like a lot of the stuff is still done by person. You know? Yeah. There are some car manufacturers where they actually, you know, pride themselves on doing that. Right. Mm -hmm. And normally, normally is it built by humans, um, specific aspect, like the engine, for instance, it's usually one person and they get to engrave their name on the engine <laughs> yeah. too. Right. Yeah. It's like, I built this. Yeah. It's yeah. Just, it's funny because, uh, you know, we've, we have a truck called Peter built. <laughs> yeah. Peter built the truck. But like big agile, like, I, I guess like, when you say like big agile, like agile with capital A, I mean you're talking about like you're talking about a, like a, a prescribed methodology on top of your agile, you know, which like any agile coach will tell you like you, that's not where you want to start. You don't want to come in with a methodology. You want to come in with you know asking why or I don't know stripping stuff back to to the lean basics. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I mean ultimately, you know. It, doing agile aligns itself to doing things in a way that you know it is for some methodology right yeah. whether you're doing kanban or whatever it is that you're doing yeah but that is in and of itself not enough like doing that does not make you little agile as an organization it simply means that you're adopting some agile work practices in some areas yeah so as an organization if you're just doing that in some you know some areas that's great it's better than none right mm -hmm. but that is not an agile organization make, right? You have to do that consistently across the board. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so here we're, we're no longer now talking about just agile software practices or building software. It's agile in HR, agile mm -hmm. in sales, mm -hmm. agile in finance, everything that is, you know, a business domain, right? Every domain has to be agile. And the sum of all of that makes an agile organization. So to get there is a much, much longer um, journey than yeah, uh, yeah. just practicing agile principles in you know software development. Yeah, like, I wonder if the, like I mean with that description, I wonder if there's any organizations out there that really are like top to bottom, truly embracing the. You know, I really like to see. Uh, I'm just pausing here because there are organizations that have done this more or less across many business domains, mm -hmm. maybe not all of them. And even with each of those, they may not be at 100%. Yeah, and that's okay. That's okay. Because again, you, know, you haven't reached that point, you haven't yeah. reached Nirvana, but you are on the way. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, this this like, this goes back to what we we're talking about earlier today, it was just like the the, the the situation that I found myself in, which is like, you're, you're, you're uh, the 
product owner or pro- product manager, whatever you want, whatever title you want to call it. Uh, but you don't have a budget to work with, but then you don't own any of the teams because like the development lead or the test lead or whatever, like they, they are the resource manager for the teams. So like you don't, you don't own money, you don't own the resources. Uh, and, and, and like you may own the, the, the timelines, maybe if the organization trusts you to come to you first for timelines before they commit the dates, but almost every organization, let me think about that for a second. Every organization that I've been in, <laughs> uh, you have uh, people that commit to dates and then approach the team. Like, oh, a sales guy told the client it's going to be eight weeks, so you got to deliver something in eight weeks. And that that's not a problem. Like, oh, okay, well, in eight weeks we can deliver X, Y, Z, whatever. Like, we can adjust scope, and that's what we can meet. And that's what everybody does. But, like, you should have come to me before you made that promise. So I don't own the deadlines. I don't own the scope, or I don't own the deadlines. I really just own the scope. I own. I don't own the deadlines. I don't own the money, and I don't own the people. So what do you own? Uh, the <laughs> backlog. Like I'm uh, welcome to being a backlog administrator. Like nobody wants to do that. No, nobody does. So essentially, you're just a uh, you know, like you said, a gatekeeper of uh, a list that you keep. You're a gatekeeper. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a backlog by itself isn't really giving any business value to anybody, right? It's just a, a temporary thing that exists for you know a certain amount of time, and then it's gone. It's fickle. Um, yeah. It means to an end, really. So if you're not empowered with the budget or the teams, you know, or, or the deadlines, you really are not a product owner per se. Uh, uh, yeah. you, you're not becoming somebody that you know is easy to blame for just about anything that can go wrong, right? <laughs> uh, so I think yeah, I think we just figured out what the job is. Yeah. Uh, 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 the blame profe- taker, professional yeah. punching bag. Yeah, professional blame taker. That's who, that's who you are. What? A, oh my! What a what a what a run run people don't <laughs> don't get oh man no <laughs> like I read on the internet Brian told me that I was a professional punching bag like that. That guy's an a hole, but he's right. Um, boy, if I had a nickel for every time I heard that. So, uh, right. like, I, like my uh, the 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 the, uh, the position I ran into recently, uh, which this is, I know that you have a, a good insight onto this one. So I'm going to bring it up now and just cut this one to the front of the line, which is um, my uh, uh, company saying, "Hey, Brian, uh, things are going great, and we really love the output of the development teams, but we can't afford a scrum master." And quite honestly, we don't really know what they do. We can break this up into separate topics, but I'm going to start with, we can't afford a Scrum Master. We'd rather use that money on developers. Also, we don't really know what a Scrum Master does. And we think uh, we read the Scrum Guide maybe, and it says it's a role, not a position. So we're going to we're gonna delete your Scrum Master, and uh, you figure it out. Uh, My goodness. Yeah, there's quite a lot there. So yes, <laughs> it's a role, right? So how, do you, how do you have a role? How do you enact that role? if not through a person. I mean, a role doesn't exist just on paper, right? It, it is actually action through an individual, yeah. a human being. So therefore you do need somebody. Now you don't have to call them a Scrum Master. Um, the fact that they believe you don't need one and then they're saying that they don't know what a Scrum Master does, those are somewhat related. If you don't know what they do, you're not gonna be sold on the value. Yeah. Um, so let's use a metaphor here. Let's say, let's say you're on a you're on one of those boats, like the Hawaii Five-O style. Right? You got a bunch of people that are rowing the boat, and you've got a uh, a person who's keeping the yeah. keeping the beat, yeah. who would be the scrum master yeah. in this case, right? So say so you don't have that person, you just give them a pair of oars and say, hey, just fall in line and, and row. Yeah. So now nobody's keeping the beat, right? So now people are just rowing, and there's no cadence. Somebody's rowing in, someone's rowing out. The boat is doing stuff, but it's not moving in a given direction. That's the end result without somebody who's a, you know, timekeeper or boat. So, you know, like the boat's not going to so, go anywhere. Dude, let, let me, let me, let me, uh, let me, uh, because like <laughs> I think uh, we're. I think this request is ludicrous, uh, but for the purposes of entertainment on the internet, I think I should uh, assume the opposite side of this argument. So I'm an executive. I'm paying a uh, metric uh, boatload of money. Uh, man, I really like. I really need to decide if I want to curse or not on the podcast. I've decided I don't want to, uh, which, which really annoys me. Um, uh, so I'm paying a bunch of money for developer uh, for developers on my team, and uh, I've got a ton of developers, 
and I'm paying him a ton of money, and uh, uh, the developers tell me I need to hire a scrum master, right? The scrum master's job, the scrum master's job is not really to write code. Their job's not really to manage my project. So, I mean, like, I am an executive. I'm having a hard time being like, what am I paying this person to do? Uh, all right. There you go. I'm going <laughs> to put you in now. Now. Yeah. Okay. So, you're paying a bunch of developers to craft some code. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, the code is of a certain quality. Sure. Right. Okay. So, let's just say all you have is developers and you'd rather not pay for Scrum Master. Mm -hmm. That's fine. So these people are doing the, their own thing, right? Developers are very proud of their their work, and everybody's got their own way of working as a developer. So let them do their own thing. Yeah. And so without having some cohesive order to the process, which is what a Scrum Master brings, what do you think is going to happen, right? Think about two, three sprints from now. You're going to have some software of dubious quality. You're going to end up paying for what is known what is known as um, you know cost of quality right is that less than paying for a scrum master and get it right the first time i don't think so uh, i mean my my uh my my pushback on that one will be uh well like i i also pay an exorbitant amount uh to my development lead like why can't my development lead uh figure that out like aren't they the lead of development can't they lead my developers towards better uh quality your development lead is there for their expertise, their, their technical prowess. They're not there for their process knowledge, right? So they have, you're just adding one more developer to the team and calling them a lead, and they're doing things their way. And at the very most, what you can expect them to do is to influence their way on all these other developers. But, but they have but they have lead in their title. That means they're leading the developers, right? Because the, people, they're professional people in the development hierarchy that lead they teach development leadership that, that's like where where do where do developers learn their leadership skills i wonder like i feel like I'm, I'm like i'm straying from the point now i need to get back to the point because like now now my 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 now my inner child is showing because my inner child wants to burn things down and uh sometimes i i let uh the child burn things down but uh this is another one of those things like I'll just I'll just let my development lead figure things out, and um, you like they probably could make the argument. I, I should go somewhere with this point. They probably could make the argument that the development lead could play the role of scrum master and kind of bounce from scrum team to scrum team to scrum team, which you and I both know. Like, okay, well, the development lead is trying to do architectural. They're trying to lay down development standards. They're trying to help the junior developers or maybe the mid mid level developers do planning, and and they're trying to help all their teams stay in line with the technical standards. They might be reviewing pull requests. They might be, you know, what I mean, they, they might be uh, working on stuff that has nothing to do with coding. It might be uh, operational tasks with pipelines and stuff like that. And making, they might be doing stuff that has nothing to do with the actual work. N nothing to do. It has everything to do. But you know what I mean? Like yeah, no, yeah. Nothing to do with the actual coding of it. But um, nothing to do with features is what I'm saying. But but likely their entire day is filled with um, making sure that people are following the technical vision and direction that they are laying down okay now we can pivot to the other side of the house and be like well maybe we can put that on our test lead maybe they have a test lead maybe they're a larger organization they have like a qa manager or a test manager or something like that well, maybe i can empower the qa manager or the test manager with my with my um um, um or uh, organizational agility scrum mastery etc etc et you know Maybe that's a better position because they're they're not doing all this technical stuff that the development lead is doing. Um, I mean, what do you think about that? Yeah, so I think you just made the perfect argument why development lead cannot do a scrum master's role because they are doing all these things that you mentioned, right? Day to day, their day is filled with all of those things. So when when are they scanning for risks? When are they removing impediments? Right? They, they just don't have time, which is why you need somebody else who understands the process, who understands how to raise impediments, yeah. and knows the ins and outs of getting things done. Yeah. Not the technical coding part, which is where the lead kind of is, well, leading the yeah. other developers, yeah, right? Yeah. Providing direction, technical direction. Um, as far as the technical lead or a QA lead or a QA manager, usually those roles are there in a matrixed organization, and these QA managers are simply a, a person that the 
QA um, testers report to. Yeah. But then each tester is assigned to a team. Team, yeah. So the QA manager is a, a is an organizational um, role, yeah. but they don't actually uh, um, you know get themselves embedded to a team mm-hmm. usually, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so all of that says that you still need somebody who is there to scan for risks, to remove impediments, and that is the Scrum Master. Now, there has been an argument made for this role to be rotated among the team, right? So a developer could act as a Scrum Master for a sprint, and then another developer could do that. That assumes a fairly high level of um, agile maturity. Yeah. And yes, it can be done. Yeah. It can be done. But you're not going to have all your developers a, willing to do this because, well, it's, they're not crafting code and they don't want to deal with all this political stuff and running around and removing mm-hmm. impediments mm-hmm. and whatnot. And worse yet, you know, reporting metrics, right, to the yeah. PMO. They don't want to deal with all yeah. that. Well, they're, not, they're not writing code in the time. They're, they're not writing code, which they're happy doing. So, you know, it comes back to that again. So yeah. like, who's doing all that? It's the Scrum Master again. Right, 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 right. Right. So, uh, like, I, there's another there's another uh, part of this that I'd like to dig into, but I, I don't want to dig into it now just because we're, we're going to run out of time like crazy, which is like, uh, which is like, um, I, th- I, I wrote an article a while back. Uh, I wrote a blog a while back. Uh, you know, it never got published because, like, you know, the, I write a certain way and like, it wasn't the article they were looking for, but they didn't they didn't say anything to me. So they just didn't do anything with it. Uh, they just buried it, right? Which is fine. Whatever. I wrote it. it made me feel better for writing it. Right. Um, uh, but uh, it, has, it has to do with it has to do with this item, which is like has to do with this item, which is like okay, you're 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 gonna take your guy and you're gonna say you you're not gonna write code for. Let's say you just have one team. Actually, no, no, no. Actually, let's be more realistic. Let's say you have two teams. You're the scrum master now. We're gonna rotate roles. So now, forty percent of your time. Uh, for the next two weeks, let's say you have a two week sprint, 40% of your time is going to be just like going to stand ups, going to the, going to, going to all the different scrum events and whatever, you know what I mean? Like going to your sprint plannings, uh, kind of facilitating different things. So basically you got a guy that almost half of his time now is not writing code. Okay. Like that you're going to, that's what you're going to do with one of your developers. And how happy will they be with that? You know, and, 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 and you're not, and like, let, let's even say that you train Everybody, everybody joins your organization. You send them to the CSM training. Okay, first of all, I, like n- I've never seen any other organization other than one. We'll put ours to the side. Uh, actually, send everybody, every single, literally every employee to CSM training. Okay, so you're making that commitment. You're going to say right. everybody on my development teams is going to be uh, go through CSM training or whatever PSM whatever training, mm-hmm. uh, and then you're going to rotate the role. Okay, so here, here, here's what I feel like when you decide you're going to rotate there. I've been in an organization that rotated the role. Here, here's what happened. Uh, whoever uh, had the role uh, that, that, that week or whatever, they did the bare minimum to get along, and then they were never really good at it because they never really put in the time to be good at it. You know? But the organization didn't like it. That organization didn't really like – they didn't want someone to be good at it because they just wanted someone to do the – to do what was requested uh, and not question it and, uh, you know, get, get – you know, get get run over, I guess, or whatever. It's the designated person to yell at for the week. Yeah, yeah right, <laughs> right. Yeah, the designated punching bag for the week. Yeah. No, you're right. People aren't really, you know, people aren't really committed, right? When when you just say forty percent of your time you're going to be doing this, but really you're a developer and we're going to measure you on your development skills, not this. Here. So it's a chore. Yeah. It becomes a chore at that point. Yeah. And they just want to get it over with, right? So again, you, you come back to. Are you applying consistent agile principles all the time if you have a rotating role, Scrum Master? Dude, uh, the the other thing, like I, I really like, I I feel like uh, you know, we're recording is twenty minute. We're twenty minutes in to just this topic. Like I feel I could go another forty five minutes just on this topic because like there's other questions like, well, what is what is the actual day of my Scrum Master look like? You know, like day to day, like a com- you come in at the beginning of the day, just walk me through what the day looks like. Like that, that should be a question. I need. To, I don't have my phone. I, I'll I'll write it down for next time. But that like a uh, day in the life of. I I could talk forever about the topic of like, well, what, you know, what walk me through it. Like I'm the executive. I don't, I'm not convinced that I want to hire a scrum master full time. Like, what do they actually do? Walk me through the li- like the day in the life of. 
You know what I mean? And like I, it would be very difficult for me to walk you through a day in life of because like the scrum master's role is dealing with the people. So like, uh, the, the, if you look at the scrum guide, it's, I should probably pull up the scrum guide and like read what it actually says. But uh, it's going to say uh, something along the lines of like, facilitates the sessions, maybe because you can you can designate the other team. Or the, the the meetings are for the development team. Mm-hmm. So whether you come to them or not, even I think the new Scrum Guide says the developers are the ones that have to be there, and like the PO and the Scrum Master are optional. I think I could be wrong. I need to go read. I, yeah, I don't remember that, but it's possible. It mm, says that. I feel like this is something I want to check while I like while I'm recording. Uh, uh, scrum Guide. I know the, the PO has always been optional. Oh, I have no internet. Oh well. Well, I guess I'll check it later. PO has always been optional. Pfft, like the PO is the one guy over the scrum master that needs to be there every single time, in my opinion. Uh, dude, I, like as PO, I have to be. At the, like if they have questions, they need to be answered immediately so the team can move on. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway, anyway, even like whatever. Even if I'm wrong, the point of me, uh, point of me going down this tangent is um, the scrum master has to make sure that the the team members are uh, get unblocked when they're when they get blocked. You know, but, but, and, th- and this is something I told my scrum master on, the, on this past project, which is like, this, in my opinion, best scrum masters can do everyone's job, but they're not here to do everyone's job. I mean, I mean, I guess you could argue that. You could be like, well, they're not, you, you could argue like, well, they're not, they're not, I mean, they're not full develop. If they were full developers, they'd be developing probably. But they generally can do a bit of the PO's job. You know, because like usually, like almost uh, the way that I came up to where I'm at now was uh, I would basically like the the PO would be in the room and I would be driving, facilitating the meetings, and I would be writing the stories with the team. Basically, I would be taking dictation from the team. They would talk about what they wanted the story to be, and I would write it onto the team. And so that I got really good at writing, um, you know, air quotes requirements. Mm-hmm. Um, because I was facilitating all the sessions. And basically all the PO had to do was they had to bring themselves, <laughs> which sometimes is very difficult for the PO to do. They had to bring themselves in an undistracted manner, and they had to bring their business expertise. And if they had subject matter experts that were required for the discussion, they had to bring them to the meeting. So I just set the stage. I'd be there. I'd, I'd make sure they, their hands and eyes and whatever were unencumbered by, like, writing requirements or whatever, and then I would just do everything and the team would throw in and ask questions or whatever, and we'd have it on the screen, and we'd write and do whatever. And like that was something the scrum master provided. So the scrum master in that in, in how I got to here was a, like a little mini BA, but also a facilitator for those sessions, and made sure that like kind of herded everyone together and figured out the schedules and stuff like that. Um, so like the the thing about like well what do you do with your time I'm like well do what like what do you do on a scrum team when like somebody's not performing what do you do on a scrum team when like someone's having a hard time in their personal life or whatever and they're bringing shit in to work with them ooh I didn't want to curse but I did it anyway you know what what, what do you, what do you do when somebody's like somebody's obviously turning in uh, 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 you know somebody's obviously phoning it in because they're going through a rough time in their personal life or whatever like the scrum master's got to sit down with them one on one. Right, and tell them, you know, hey, man, you got you got to take some vacation or do whatever or do you know take some time off or do it. You know, they have to have difficult one on one conversations that have nothing to do with work. Okay, like yeah, they have everything to do with getting the work done. They, they certainly do. They have everything to do with ha- having a good functional team that works well together. You have you get two people on a team that don't work well together. Whose job is it to sit down? Oh, well, well, Brian, it's not it's not it's not the scrum master job. They got to work it out. We're all adults here or whatever. Yes, yeah, that's true. I hear you, Internet. Calm the f*** down. That's not what I'm saying, though. Like, what I'm saying is the Scrum Master is the mediator. The Scrum Master is the facilitator. You know what I mean? They're, they're the adult in the room in that instance. You know, if they see two people fighting or whatever, like, uh, fighting in an unproductive manner, like, that's the Scrum Master. Mm-hmm. You know? It's 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 a lot of soft skills, right? At that point, which is why it's difficult to convince someone that you need a scrum master because it, it, it these execs that are saying you know I'm paying for developers, well that's a that's a hard skill. Yeah, soft skills like ah, we're all adults, right? We should just get along. 
doesn't work that way in real life. We're humans first. I mean, I, dude, I guess it could work in a situation where, like, you, you have a company that has, like, I, I don't know, uh, regular trainings and refreshers and stuff on, like, conflict management and, like, that. The, the, the corporate America should, like, they're way behind in the times, in my opinion. They should have, all, they, like, if you're in corporate America, you should have regular reoccurring refreshers of, like, the, like let's have some role play, let's have some workshops, let's have some whatever to deal with conflict, to figure out where we're going, to business direction and goals and stuff like that. Like, um, uh, But like, I've, I've almost never went through any of that stuff in my career. No. You know, six, <laughs> almost 20 years of my career has been almost 20 years. I've almost never went through stuff like that. You know. All, all of that is, it requires, you know, forethought, right? And there isn't much of that. Yeah, it's all bottom line driven. Right? I, that costs money, so let's not bother. I don't understand why. It, like, it costs so little, though. It does. Yeah. You know, it's like, dude, if you're gonna if you're gonna put snacks or whatever in in, in the break room or whatever, or have some sodas or waters or like, like the cost of maintaining that, the cost of somebody bringing somebody in every quarter just to like refresh your team, you know, it, it, is 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 so less by, by comparison. Anyway, the, like the point of me bringing this topic up, like I'm, I'm the, this is the podcast of sidetracks right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm I, hopefully it's entertaining to like one person on the internet. Fifth, thank you for that yeah, one person. Thank, thank you. Stay thank you, with us person. so far. Thank, thank thank you, one person. We're on the wide angle. That's gonna be the that's gonna be the the the, the graphic for this uh, for this podcast right here. Um, <laughs> The, the the point of me bringing this up is like you're like the, the what what I sat down with my scrum master in the, in the just just like uh, two weeks ago three weeks ago something like that was uh, my scrum master was asking me boy really and like not naming names uh, is difficult uh, but it's a good rule it's a really good rule but it's a difficult um, my scrum master asked me because you can't even say she asked me. No, so you have to use uh, gender gender neutral names. Yeah, like, yeah. That's uh, Kim or Chris. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'm cutting all that. I uh, know <laughs> uh, my 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 scrum master asked me, uh, like, uh, you know, how, like if, if an executive asks for something uh, and uh, like doesn't want to talk about reasons or whatever, if they're being unreasonable, like executives have a way of being unreasonable when they're asking for stuff for stuff. And I'm like, yeah, of course it, it, they're doing that because like the role of executive basically allows you to operate in the, in this, in the transactional analysis world. It allows you to operate as a child and uh, everybody else is expecting you to be the parent in the room because you're an executive that the level of authority is supposed to be vested in the position. Uh, except uh, when you slip into being a child, like everyone has to respect you as a parent, but you're actually just being a little child. Uh, you know, be like, oh, I want, like, I have to have this in the next release. It's got to be blah, 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 blah. I don't care about your estimation. I don't care about, you know, you, um, uh, you know, a good example is uh, I went through this recently, uh, which is, um, uh, oh, I got to have this in the next eight weeks or whatever. I gotta have all this functionality. I, I need a new mobile app written for me in the next eight weeks. And I'm sitting there and I'm going, uh, uh, okay, we can do it. We can do that, there's no problem. If you want a, 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 a shell of an app on iOS or Android, one or the other, not both, iOS or Android, a shell of an app that you can log into and then it shows you a main screen and then all the data on the back end is hard coded and it goes directly to where you wanna go. That's what we can do in eight weeks, you know? Oh well, I don't know if that's gonna be good enough for whatever. I'm like, oh, well, okay, well, I, I'm I'm barely on the fence about giving you even that because I don't even have it. Like we we're hiring a team to do it. I was like, we don't have a team yet. I was like, I need a team. I need them working together for two or three sprints just to see how they work. Yep. And um, I need all that in place before I can even give you and build you an estimate. Right. Like I can build you a high level estimate and which we'll adjust it every so often or whatever. But I was like. Eight weeks? Eight weeks is nothing. Yeah. Eight weeks goes by so fast. Eight weeks yeah. is, eight weeks is for, uh, so from this point right now to eight weeks in the future, okay? This point right now, I have no team. There's no team on paper or in actuality. I haven't even hired the people. I'm like, dude, I can't, not only can I not give you an estimate, but you don't even know what, what's involved in the work. Yeah, but even if you if you got the team, let's say today, they can't be productive tomorrow. I mean, it takes time to you know equipment with their laptops and get their corporate access set up and all of that stuff. 
the, the usual onboarding pains, right? Um, so when they're demanding something by you know eight weeks, it has to be something like a, a facade, basically. Yeah. If you click buttons A, B, and D, this, these predetermined things will happen. None of that is real, like you said, fake data, but it would look real if your intent is to show it off at a conference or, or something like that. We can meet that objective. Yeah. Right. But you're not going live with anything. So, no, you know, let's just make sure we're aligned on that. Yeah. Right. It can be a demo yeah. as long as it's a scripted demo and you just yeah. don't stray off script. Ah, but like, 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 I feel like I, uh, like I, I segue too much. Like the, the, the point of this is do the scrum master, like an organization doesn't understand what the scrum master does. Like in that type of organization, like the scrum master could be the guy in the middle of the, uh, guy could be the person whatever guy girl whatever it could be the person in between the stakeholders which in our case is a c-level executive the stakeholder because this is actually in my case it was multiple c-level executives be like oh yeah eight weeks is is good enough yeah yeah we can totally do an eight weeks uh and then i as the product owner have to be like what the hell is going on here like, I, we, we don't have a team. What are you talking about, eight weeks? Where did this eight weeks come from? Like, the Scrum Master should have been the person in the middle of that being like, here's here's what we need to, like, listen, both you guys have valid points, mm-hmm. okay? You guys are obviously operating in, uh, like, <clears throat> like, you guys over here ob- obviously are operating as a child, which is like, I want this. I don't care what it takes. Like I, this is what I want, and I like I, I'm an authority, so whatever, whatever. Um, on the other side uh, is I don't even know how I'm, I think I'm operating as an adult in this. Uh, if if I can go out on a limb here, I think I'm operating as an adult and saying like because I I'm bringing my rational self to the discussion. I'm saying okay, look, we don't we don't have the ability to ask me because we don't have a team spun up. So if we spin a team up, we'll be able to do this, and then we'll have to sit down with the team and decide how and, and talk about the feature we want. And yes, we can decide we can bring features in and out and cut scope and do whatever, but like. We need the team first, and then let the, engage the team. Get estimates from the team. We'll build the timelines, and then we'll move scope around, and we'll do whatever. But like, I can't give you an estimate at all right now. And of course, the executive the executive pushback on that is like, you have to give me an estimate because I'm asking you, and I pay your salary, so I have to. Okay, dude. This, again, the transactional analysis of the scrum master. This is like this scrum master is such a weird position. This yep. is why I prefer being a product owner. I think this is why I prefer being a product owner. I don't have to deal with this stuff as a product owner. I'm like, I can't give you an estimate. You give me the money. I, I'll get the team. I'll give you the estimate. I'll build the software. Right. Okay. You, know, you give me the you you give me the timeline and the money, or you give me the request and then I'll give you the timeline and ask for the money. Like I, I need I need something that I control. Right. Okay? Yeah. But like I need I need like the scrum master would be like. They're, in this situation, they would be a neutral arbiter. I, I, like, it's just like there's so many like you call them soft skills. I call them like psychological like skills. You know what I mean? Like, I need somebody who can who can be the adult, the other adult. Actually, I don't even need an adult. I'm being the adult. They're being a child. I need someone to assume the role of the parent in this situation. Yeah, and be like, look, I will help you all resolve this. This is what I need from you, child. This is what I need from you, adult. You know, and this is this is the the course that I think is best or whatever. That, that's what I really need in that. Uh, like, I think there's something here that I want to really like. I need to take a whole session to talk about of uh, of like pitch me on a scrum master. You know, pitch me on a scrum master from a position of like I don't have one and I want one, and the position of like I don't think I need one. How can I get along without having one? That sounds like a great topic for an entire session. I mean, you can incorporate the day in the life off in that as well, right? Yeah. You know, because you're trying to pitch that. So this is what Scrum Master does. Let me give you some ideas about what's involved in Scrum Master's day to day. You know, every day is different, of course, but yeah, I think that's a great topic. Yeah, we're we're gonna have to we're gonna have to cover that one. We're gonna have to cover that one separately. I mean, you know, like. We have to cover that one separately. I, I I have different thoughts on that. I'm going to save that one right here because uh, I don't want to lose that one. We're, we're, like I, I'm, we already burned way more time than I wanted to. We're not going to get to any of this crap. Like the the one I want to get to, this is the one I want to get to. This is the one I want to get to. That's the one I want to get to. But let me let me let me let me do this. This one's going to take two seconds. Sure. So like like. Um, um, 
like we had we had a discussion uh we had a discussion last time about this which is like uh hey i'm I'm like i'm super excited i'm flying out to the client i'm gonna be in their corporate office we're gonna do a big story mapping session and maybe a little like take pieces of roadmap and story map it out and figure out how to do it and get along whatever and uh you gave me some great advice which was um you know, they like they just onboarded a new PO, and he was gonna he was trying to figure out like get his footing and figure like he he will, he'll be I'll have him under my wing for a while until he gets his footing, and then um, I got my scrum master there, so she, uh, my scrum master can can deal with some of this stuff as well because it's good for the because scrum master should be able to do basic storyboarding type stuff, okay, and then um, and then uh, I also got some advice from from other people that was like. Um, um, while the storyboarding is going on, you can sit down with your, uh, I can't remember what it's called, like a product canvas or whatever that has like all the, all the you, you know yeah, what I'm talking about? Canvas, okay. Yeah, product canvas. Yeah, yeah, like with a product canvas. Like I'll sit here with a product canvas and like as we go through the storyboarding, I'll make sure that like things fit, what where, where things fit. Which you know, box, for the business. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'll be like talking with the, the C-level executives that were there with the storyboarding. Okay. Um, and then kind of build in breaks to kind of coach the team as they move along with the storyboarding and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. That would have been a great. That would have been great. But I, I, I couldn't do it. Like I, I dude. I, and the funny thing is, like I, dude, with you, I talked about my personality when I was preparing. I talked about my personality with them. I was like, listen, I, they're, pe- they're gonna start hammering me with questions, and I'm gonna take over the whole session, and uh, I'm just gonna just run over everyone. I'm gonna start moving stickies around and writing things, and and as the questions flow, I'm gonna redirect. Que- and like I'm not gonna be able to step back. Like they're gonna start hammering me with questions, hammering me with questions, and I'm gonna get like thrust into center stage, and I'm not gonna be able to give it up. And that's exactly what happened. Wonderful, uh, dude. I was I I gotta tell you, man. I I was so disappointed with myself. Uh, because I, I dude, I, I feel like uh, I feel like uh, it's probably too real for a podcast right now. Like I did, I feel like I could have had that. <laughs> I I talked to everyone actually. Actually, I, later that night, I was like, I was like, do you guys understand the concept of kayfabe? And nobody knew what the hell I was talking about. Do you know what kayfabe is? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I was like, I was like, uh, I was like. The concept of kayfabe in pro wrestling is like we're, we're, like, we're all like feigning, uh, acting, uh, fighting with each other, whatever. But it's actually all scripted. It's really fake. Uh, but but we're actually going through with it. It's just the, we're arguing or performing or doing whatever. But it's like we all, we decided what the outcome was going to be ahead of time. So it's like apparently none of them knew what kayfabe was. I guess they're not pro wrestling fans or whatever. But I I, I told them I'm like. Uh, I'm like that. That's that's a damn shame because, uh, like, at any point in time, anybody could put, could have pulled me aside to explain to me like, "Hey, uh, you're being really overbearing right now," uh, or "You're doing what you said you shouldn't have done right now," and uh, and you're really screwing up an opportunity to like put me over as uh, the person who can do the storyboarding. You know what I mean, or or show 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 the other people in the room that like the scrum master or the new PO or this other pro, or the business and you know, the, the BA or whatever, basically anybody who's not me, like to, to show that like I trust you to run this session, and uh, and I will help you uh, showcase your skill at doing whatever. That that was the part that upset me the most. Yeah. It, is that I failed to let my team team member shine. Uh, even if they, even if they weren't, uh, even if I had a legitimate concern, they were not a, as efficient or as thorough or whatever as I would have been directing the conversation. Like I really, it really upset me later that night. It would have upset me too. You know, I, I'd look at it. You know, even if they're not as efficient, but are they effective? If they're effective, then we've achieved our objective, yeah. really, yeah. right? Because it's just a. It's just again, it's it's a means to an end. So, yeah, I agree. It is frustrating though. I do share that you with know, you. I, you like, know? I, I feel like I, I I really messed that one up. I really messed that one up because I could I could have I could have really put their their new guy had was only there for like a week. So it was like basically this was like his real first week because I he I I was remote his real first week and then I was there his second week. So yeah. in reality, it was his real first week. 
but like I could have put him in the center stage and be like, you're, you're, I'm a contractor. I have a timeline where I'm out. You know what I mean? You, you like, you are the permanent employee. Like I'm going to force you to do everything because this is your roadmap. This is your backlog. This is your product. And eventually it'll be his vision. It won't be my vision anymore. That's right. You know what I mean? I'll be like, no, no, no. I am going to let you tell me what the priorities are. And that should have been the way that I went about it. And then he would have had a bunch of questions or whatever. And then I would have been like, don't ask me. Ask my scrum master. Because mm -hmm. my scrum master should be able to answer any question I can answer. And I could have just sat back with the executives and been like, this is what you should. you know, Because the, they, they would have been looking to me to answer everything. That's exactly what they did. They looked to me to answer everything. Whenever there was a question or a conversation stalled or whatever, they looked to me. And then instead of being like, well, Mr. Scrum Master person, like, how do you think we should handle this? Or, hey, Mr. New Product Owner, how do you think we should handle this? Instead, I just answered the question, you know. Yeah. No, I, I get that. I get that. It's easier often to just answer the question than, you know, putting in all of that legwork. Yeah. Because you have a finite time to achieve that objective anyway. And so you're like, okay, let me just get it done. Yeah, they, they, well, I mean, that, that was my, that was my, that's the reason I did it because I was like, these, all, we had a bunch of different topics back to back to back. And then like all the time boxes were way too short, in my opinion. It, sh it, we, it should have been like, it should have been two and four hours should have been the only options for time boxes for what we were doing. Uh, because we were, we were kind of jumping from topic to topic to topic uh, very, very quickly. And uh, I should have, I should have, uh, I should have had a lot more. I, I should have set the schedule my, myself. I should not have delegated the setting of the schedule. Uh, as a product owner, I should have said, from the hours of nine a.m. to eleven, we're going to talk about this topic, and then we're going to break for whatever forty-five minutes or whatever, and then from twelve, you know, to whatever eleven forty-five, twelve, or whatever, and through lunch, we're going to talk about this other topic. Um, and I, I should have set the schedule. I, should, I delegated all that to set the schedules. And when the schedules got set, they got set to like 45 minutes at a time. Like the discussion being 45 minutes long and like without a break was fine. The problem is when we when we took a break and came back to the next session, it was a different topic. Yeah. And I'm like, we're not done with this topic, you know? Yeah. Uh, so uh, th that's, that's the one thing. And I wish I would have, when I got to the client on the first day, I wish I would have not had meetings on the first day. I wish I would have taken the first day, sat down with their product owner, sat down with my scrum master, sat down with maybe a executive a stakeholder from executive or whatever, and planned out um, everything, and like printed out cards. Like we did storyboarding, we had cards and stuff like that. But like I had some things I already knew I wanted, so I should have printed those out ahead of time rather than sketching them out on the fly or whatever. So uh, yeah, I'm just like. We made progress. I mean, I like I don't want to be like, oh, we didn't make progress. But we would have made progress if I had done everything myself. But we would have made progress as well if I if I could have just like made it a team thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. So in hindsight, would you say those time boxes would, would be increased, and maybe not everything has to be the same time, same length of a time box? Uh, I. Yeah, they, the, the, for, in, okay, in hindsight, in hindsight, I would have stayed there. I, I didn't have a lot of time to. I was only there for three, three and a half days. Right. In hindsight, I, I should have been there the entire week, Monday through Friday. I should have booked just booked five days. You know, I could have flown back on the weekend or whatever, or maybe flown out late Friday night or whatever. In, in hindsight, I wish the time boxes, I wish I would have given, I could still delegate the time boxes. Of figuring out what we're talking about in these time boxes but i wish i would have delegated time boxes of being uh i'd be like you can only pick two hours or four hours for the time box yeah i wish i would have done that you know because we did a bunch of time boxes that were like i don't know an hour or an hour and a half or something like that um and it was just too short to cruise through the topics i would concur with that yeah you know that that's why that's and that's the main reason i felt i needed to jump in because I was like, we only have 45 minutes to talk about it. Reality, we only had 45 minutes. It's like, yeah. we only have 45 minutes to talk about it. The executives are already looking uncomfortable because we're not moving. They're asking me questions because they're trying to get me excited to get us moving. Uh, so they're like kind of prompting me. And uh, I, I, like, I wish I would have just been like, 
you know what, we're just going to cancel the next time box and use this time for that or whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I, 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 I learned a lot uh, in that session, but uh, it was a great, great disappointment to myself. I mean, like the, the, biggest, the, the biggest disappointment for me is when I feel like I disappointed my own team members. You know, disappointing stakeholders, like, I'll disappoint <laughs> stakeholders all day. Like, they're stakeholders, okay? Like, they, they have their own, they'll make themselves disappointed. Even, like, the way I feel about a stakeholder is, like, even if they get everything in the world handed to them on a silver plate, they will still find a way to be disappointed. Absolutely. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think it's a prerequisite to be a stakeholder. Yeah. Uh, like, <laughs> I, I'm more upset that, I, like, I disappointed my own team members, that I had a chance to, to, to put them over, you know, make them look good, and that uh, I, I screwed that up. Well, you know, maybe uh, next opportunity, we'll recalibrate, and try a different approach. Well, this uh, this didn't go as planned. I didn't even get to any of these topics. That was that was the overbearing PO and tactical oh, nice ways to deal with me. I, I don't know. I, the, like the, that's the other thing too that that came out of that is uh, you know I was like oh, we could like let's work out a code word or work out something and like just cut me off man just just jump in like I don't mind I tell everybody all the time I was like I don't mind being cut off I don't mind you know being like hey Brian uh, why don't why don't we take a break and uh, we can continue this and I'll be like ah oh, do we really need to take a break like we're figuring stuff out I'll be like no I think we should take a break now you know like uh, or some something like that just to let me know that like hey I think we need to talk one-on-one you know and then my scrum master or whoever can pull me in and be like hey uh you know you're you're way off base here and whatever but like that that didn't happen in that session and uh uh like part of it is because i like god so it's so disappointing it was just, just it was a disheartening experience in in the moment it was like i just need to get through it you know what I mean? But afterwards, when I had a minute to slow down and think about what just happened, I was like, man, I, I, I wish I could do it again. I would do everything different. E- even if we didn't even get half the stuff produced that we got, I'd be like, I don't care. I don't care. Because I'm going to take this opportunity to show them like, oh, the Scrum Master. This goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning. Oh, the Scrum Master can do all this storyboarding, digging deep into topics and stuff that the product owner can do. Oh, so in a way, the Scrum Master can extend the capabilities of the product owner in some cases. Oh, oh I think there's some real value in having an extra person who can kind of pick off the extra tasks that are kind of floating out there. Yeah, yeah, there is. You know. Yeah, you know, every single time I go through an experience I always look back and think I'm going to do this differently next time and I do and then something else comes up so I'm going to do that one differently next time so I guess it's the process of uh, of learning and, and growing through it yeah no. it's the little A we're getting towards the little A yeah well that was my that was my disappointing experience of the week so I get to share that with the internet now sorry internet well I like to end these on a downer <laughs> <laughs> Talk about a downer. We, we, we now have a Chinese spacecraft heading straight for planet Earth. It's, I love it. It's great. I they don't know it. where it's going to land. I love it. They think it's going to land in the ocean. Well, of course, right? There's more water than land mass. So, of course, they're going to say that. I love it. But they have no idea where I, it's going to land. I hope it lands right on me, dude. Like, that'll be the, uh, that's a, that'll, like, that'll be a great obituary. I, I love the way the scientists position this. There's a very, very, very small chance that it will land on on land it will be in the water we think but we don't know it'll be coming down in the air and it'll be one of those things where you're seeing it and you're like oh look, i gotta move i'm not quite sure you ever throw a ball in here and you're not quite oh, yeah, sure where yeah. it's going yeah, yeah. it'll be that <laughs> then kind of thing. it ends up hitting me square between the eyes yeah. anyway yeah well so let's look out look out for some fireballs and yeah. dodge away from them oh man i do love fireball <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I probably cut this one off. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Well, you know what? Uh, like, listen. Uh, like, we got the new backdrop. I like it. Uh, it's it's the, great. I like the I like the new the new digs. We got the new space. Yeah. Uh, I hope to be here for a while. I don't know who I'm gonna have on in the future, but uh, I I think I'm gonna buy another boom arm so we can have a third person. That'll be cool. 
and uh, uh, you know try not to abuse it or whatever. <laughs> you need a, a new mic too, right? Uh, yeah, I'll have to buy another microphone. That's no problem. I love these microphones. These microphones. These are, are great. Yeah. They don't even like you won't even hear it. This this room is very echoey because it's all glass and and nonsense. But uh, you won't you won't even hear it. 